Okay, uh, good afternoon, folks. So let's start. So today we'll uh, look at rest of the security principles. In the last class we covered some security principles. So the security principles that we will uh, study are the following. Okay, we'll look at each one of these, and then we'll uh, see how we can apply this. Whole idea is that the principles that we have discussed so far, you can apply whenever uh, you are designing uh, a system for security or you want to include security as a main or uh, important feature okay all right so these are the references that i have taken uh, can you please uh, mute your mic this will help me okay all right. So, you know, I would suggest you to subscribe to Bruce uh, Schneider's uh, uh, blogs. I read his blogs. They're very interesting. He's considered one of the best in uh, security fields, especially on policies. And he's also, I think, he's a visiting professor at MIT as well. But his uh, lectures, if you look at, if you search for the name in on YouTube, you will find a lot of uh, very interesting uh, seminars or presentations. Okay. Now, uh, these two links I have included, uh, you know, I mean, is there in uh, Moodle? Is, uh, or you click on this one, you know, if you receive PPT, click on this one, you will get the paper and uh, please go through these two papers. Interesting to read. Okay. Little bit about risk management. See, when you are, suppose you're designing a security for your home, then you have to consider some threats. You can consider every possible threat. A threat may be somebody may drop a bomb, you know, but you can't protect your house if someone drops a bomb, okay? So you have to think of the threats, a few threats, which you think important and do protection for that because even if you suppose you want to have protection from you know for example bomb if you are in israel you will think about it okay but if you are in india you don't have to think about this kind of threat okay all right um, so you can it means that you cannot control every possible threat because you have only limited amount of money for threat protection to protect yourself from that threat. Okay. So uh, when you're designing a house or something, just think of the threats that uh, th that are very likely to happen or may happen. And then think of protection around it. For example, somebody may get into your house with when you are not in home and your old mother is there then possibly somebody may enter then you have this is a very very feasible uh, threat right so you'll have to think about it how to protect people who are living in home from some external entity you have to think that somebody may when you are not at home somebody may sneak into your house and many other threats right so uh, and if somebody sneaks in then can, are you able to still protect your valuables Think of some of those threats which are feasible. Similarly, in computer system, you cannot afford to have all kinds of, you know, mechanism to uh, to counter threats, okay? Because you have limited amount of money. This this point already we discussed that uh, spending for security is based on impact and likelihood of potential harm. Okay, you cannot just keep on spending money thinking that uh, something will happen and likelihood is very less right so always is uh, economics all right so this cartoon appeared in 1993 uh, which says that one dog is working on internet and the other it, the, the, this dog tells other dog that on the internet nobody knows you are a dog in fact when i started working around same time you know it, it was impossible to you know in fact, use websites because how do you know about website if you don't have directory? 
okay how do you know uh, who else is there on internet okay there are very few people even till uh, year 1990 i remember one there were hardly few places where internet you know emails were available in india only iits were had this ernet and some government organization and these companies had were connected or these organizations connected through ernet no no nothing nobody else right no other organization so nobody knew who else is there on the internet right and then time came after maybe 10 years and people realized that you know uh, that that uh, you know but in the past nobody knew that you were on internet so people start knowing about you know other people who are on internet and today everyone knows about you that you are on internet right okay so this up uh, this, this cartoon appeared recently in new york times so on internet everybody knows that you are a dog all right okay now one question to you is it dangerous the cyber criminals know you is it or is it not So basically, what the cyber criminals are going to do with you? They are going to steal your money and assets, right? They can attack uh, on you in many ways, or they can ask you for some money for, in exchange of some information they have about you. Okay. So how do you, how are they going to attack you? Because in any system there is a identity you you log into a system or you get into a system into your back account using your user id and you use password and some other mechanisms right if if a cyber criminal knows about you your, your user id your name your date of birth your photograph and there is a possibility that you know his job or her job is half done okay Okay, can somebody follow your footprints and reach you? Someone means a cyber criminal. Okay, you are leaving your footprints everywhere when you is travel on the internet or when you browse through an you know, internet, your footprints are everywhere. Okay, leaving them. Do but cyber criminals are careful not to leave footprints. Okay, so what are your footprints? Just think about it. What do you leave when you browse something? Who knows about you that you have browsed, browsed something? Okay, you may leave your footprints, uh, you know, uh, because you want to leave your footprints or, you know, or your identity. For example, you know if you are uh, on twitter facebook uh, or you have personal websites or i don't know there are many such social media sites where you leave everything i mean every everything about you is there yeah you, your name your yeah your name your identity your photograph and so on and so forth can this photograph be used or misused i'm asking you How can they use your photograph for logging in? Can they use your photograph for facial recognition? Is it possible? Think about it. Now you, since you're thinking of doing this course, start thinking like a security officer. Or a, or a criminal. Can somebody use your photograph to steal information about you? Can somebody logging using your photograph? Can they convert this into kind of 3D or face uh, made of clay or something and use that to log in into your, uh, your account? Can they? Think about it. Huh? 
Okay, so the, you leave your active data because you want to leave. You want your you know friends to see what you are doing when you are in particular place and so on and so forth. You also leave your birth, date of birth, and I would suggest all of you to just delete your date of birth from from your Facebook etc. Because it's a very important parameter, security parameter, right? Okay, so try to reduce as much of footprint you are leaving actively on uh, social media sites and there are of course passive data like you use it uh, you know amazon.com amazon.com knows everything about you right they have all the data about your all you know name user id password of course uh, amazon.com may have password but in encrypted form but they know your ip address they know how much you spend and so on so forth. There are a lot of information they collect from you. Right? Okay, how about Google? Google even reads your emails, right? You know that, right? If you say that I want to buy an expensive car, something for more than 100K, okay, just send an email to your friend. There's a good possibility that Google uh, will sell this information to some companies like Ferrari and they will start sending it to you. Okay. But they use this. It's not that their intent is not to reveal the information about all the information, uh, but something that they will always take out the information that can be used for advertisements. Okay. So we leave a lot of data both knowingly like active data or unknowingly right and we we have to think about it right how can it be misused okay so now whatever you are sending from your machine to somewhere a website or somewhere will pass through what isp internet service provider do they know about you Of course, yes. Do they read your data? Of course, yes. Okay. Do they know your IP address? Yes. Because who? The question is that how do, how do they know about IP address? Because they themselves have given you IP address, right? Where else you get IP address? Your router gets IP address from ISP. Okay, and there is a lifetime for this IP address. So sometimes it goes for months. Okay, especially IPv6, if you are using, then uh, uh, you know, lifetime of IP address is quite high. Okay. Okay. Do they know your MAC address? What is MAC address, by the way? Anyone? Uniquely identifiable address of a device. Yeah, very good. It's a hardware address, or the Ethernet card address, right? Okay, we'll study Ethernet. So, this address, right? So, every see your IP address may change when you when you go from you know your home in Delhi to uh, to uh, IT Monday hostel, then. Uh, your IP address will change depending on location. Okay, because you logged into different router or different ISP, though they will give you uh, corresponding IP address. So IP address keeps changing as you change location, otherwise routing cannot be done, right? Okay, but your physical address or the physical address of your machine remains the same. And we'll see how we can use that. But Mac, but ISPs will also know about the physical address of the router you are connected to and so on, right? So can this IP address be exploited? Yeah, it can be exploited. How? If I know your IP address, I can, uh, your router's IP address, I can, I will ping it, will find details about it and try to log into that router right using default user id and password and i'm sure that you wouldn't have said this 
password right okay think about it okay all right so i i am leaving some question in your mind you have to answer it by probing uh, you know the trying to dig out information about it and then that's how we learn all right so let's get back to security principles so we have covered these principles okay remaining principle we'll cover today okay all right so what do you study we have studied a threat model we we'll have to like you know you're building house you'll have to think of all all thieves etc how can they exploit vulnerabilities in your house you, you start thinking about vulnerabilities your house has okay you have to think about the thieves what are their motives what all they can do right they can do physical harm okay they can also steal money or just for fun they can enter and you you know all these things you know all these kind of things you read in newspaper right okay so you have to think about what can be their motives right and then you let you have to think of how can they what can be their capabilities eh? a thief can enter with a gun also or 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 a knife or whatever right just think of their capabilities or you know they they may bring some tools to break open uh, the locker okay so think of your adversaries and then you have to think you have to you have to decide what kind of attacks we need to prevent okay and then you can take some actions around it so that's what we said in the last class right this is one example go to this link and then you will get a paper so threat can be a very trivial threat it can be very severe threat right right so for example your ex-girlfriend or boyfriend breaking into your email account and publicly releasing your correspondence with somebody okay now this seems to be you know a trivial thing uh, actually it may be trivial okay but it's not going to cause a lot of harm in terms of finance etc etc right on the other hand it uh, organized criminals breaking into your email account and then uh, sending a spam using your identity i mean you would have received some spams right like you know i am in for example even for myself uh, you know somebody pose as me and send a mail to everyone that i am in malaysia i don't have money and then please send money to some account all right so there is a solution for that you can use stronger passwords and never give your password to your intimate partner so this could be something right or you can use very strong password with which cannot be uh, broken out right by organized criminals and don't write your passwords in you know place like google photo or or hard drive somewhere where it can be stolen all right okay so this we studied in the last class we also studied that security is economics that when you are providing security features or security providing security in a system or, or in house you'll have to think how much money to spend on security because you can't secure everything right okay and then uh, we have also studied detect if you can't prevent a lot of things we can't prevent you know i mean somebody has got into your system if you are running a company and organized criminals have got into your system right and you can't do much about it right but you should know that somebody has at least got entry into your system and started stealing so you can do something around it even if you can't stop them from entering Oh, okay so so it means that you know normally uh, when some accounts are hacked in company it takes months actually for cyber criminals to get all the information and then uh, create ransomware attack if in the first few days you can find out that somebody has got into a system then then you can prevent a lot of damages right all right then defense in depth we have seen that uh, okay all right this is uh, okay the new one i guess okay that's a minute 
Okay, all right. So, okay, so now this all we have covered. Now let's look at defense in depth. This defense in depth says that we should have multiple security mechanisms, right? Multiple uh, ways of securing something. For example, you are a king. I mean, you would have gone to possibly Rajasthan uh, in Rajasthan castles are there, right? A kila we say. So if you look at the design of it, it's always on hill. Okay. Why on hill? Because from hill, you can see enemy coming in and you can attack them easily, right? And there is water body. Then there are very thick walls at the end and so on and so forth, right? So there are multiple layers of defenses. If, if enemy is able to cross first, will be difficult for some difficulty like water and so on and then if even if they are able to cross these then there will be must be third level and so on and so forth right so these are multiple levels of defense that we have right so all right all right so but more layers of defenses you create you spend money okay so you'll have to think how many layers of defense you should have. Like for example, if you're trying to protect a castle, then two walls are better than surely one wall. So you in the castle, you have first wall and then second wall. You know, but if you create 100 walls, is it going to help? No. Okay, you cannot say that uh, 101 walls are much better than 100 walls. Or 100 walls are better than 90 walls, and so on. So, some because you know, creating multi, very, very deep level of defense has multiple layers, large number of defense is not going to help you, right? Okay. So, these are some examples, you know, when ancient time securities were provided, uh, then they had a wall, and then water body, and depression, and bigger wall, and so on and so forth, right? All right. So, please go through it. In a system, in general, a computer system, what we are going to do? We have a firewall, right? Hardware protection, hardware level firewall in router. Then we have OS firewall. We'll study what firewall is. Firewall stops entry of, you know, many users, okay? For example, I have a, this is a firewall. Now all the communication, or IP messages will pass through this firewall from outside to organization inside. This firewall look at who all are coming, uh, sending IP messages, right? And will try to filter out based on some criteria. Okay? Like, you know, a security guard in your north campus, right? There is a gate and through which all the cars have got to pass through, right? The security guard may have some policies to allow or not to allow. Okay, then you can have uh, antivirus in a system. Then you have security patches. It means that, you know, I mean, every organization, for example, you buy Microsoft Word. Uh, the Microsoft Word, although you have bought once, but company will continue to send you patches. Patches is, means that improvements, right? And they, they would have found some vulnerabilities and they will, uh, find fix of those and then this fix will they will send you as a patch or they will they will send you a message that now you uh, you know update your software right these are called software patches so you apply that also and then the, you have user access control like you know you have user access control can be like login id password and so on so face recognition and all that right biometrics so it, so what we want to communicate, I want to communicate is there are multiple level of defenses even now in our systems. And even if the, even if intruder or criminal is able to pass one, there's a, the second layer of, or third layer of defense should cause difficulties for the attacker. Okay, all right. Next is uh, least privilege. What do we mean, mean by least privilege, right? Think of uh, you're going to a bank, okay? And you will see at the gate, a sentry or security guard. 
then you see some 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 uh, clerks or officers and a bank manager right now everyone has some privileges all right what is privilege of a security guard security guard will be given some privileges to roam around in certain area and if a security guard sees some suspicious activity will uh, will, will take some action right or not allow uh, criminals to get into bank or whatever right but by default can we say that uh, security guard has a privilege to get into locker area and take out the money no right so every person in organization will be given some privileges like when you go join a company organization you have some privileges you can enter cafeteria area you can enter maybe some areas but you know when you can do check in to repository only code related to your uh, work right or your project and these are the minimum privileges you are not given the maximum privileges by default then you have to ask for more privileges okay all right you you know you may work on a code uh, you will be given access only to the part of the code. You cannot get this, see the complete code. Why? While you may be able to integrate it to complete code, binary of that code, and uh, do the testing, but you are not given source code access for everything because if you steal that, then company loses the you know, most valuable asset. Okay? So in any organization, or any place least privileges should be given to a person and privileges can change depending on the policy okay so minimum so this is the minimum permission given to entity or program to do the job correctly okay and grant only those permission now i can tell you a live example from my previous company where i was heading that uh, one HR person asked me that uh, she is not given access to the code. Then I was surprised that then somebody IT guy in fact told me this and then I asked that ask her why she needs this access. Okay. She needed this access because she doesn't know coding and what she has got a HR person's role is to manage uh, employee data and why sh does she need the code base right it turns out that her friend who works in competitive com computers company wanted to access our code through this lady okay now had that access been given it means every employee of the company has access to the code base full code base then company's information will be leaked okay so everyone has in the beginning when someone joins will be given minimum possible permissions to do the job all right now as a user for example you when you get into a system log into your laptop okay you have some privileges right if you learn linux you will come to know what are your privileges as a super user okay and when you run a program, say Microsoft Word or something like that, all your privileges are transferred to this. You know, read, write, execute, or whatever, delete. Now, is it really needed? So, Linux is very poor in terms of uh, least privileges. And so is window. Please go through it uh, when you read OS. Right? Now, in real life, you know, Sir? I'm sure uh, you have a house help, housemaid or whatever. Okay. Now, she's coming to your house. Does she have full access to everything? No, she may not. She have access to rooms where she can do cleaning or whatever, but she may not have access to you know certain private areas 
you know like where the lockers are okay or even the locker the key is not uh, usually given to people right all right so the, the, you can think of this example that everyone should have minimum access the you know like help or maid should be able to enter different rooms and clean it that's all but she may not have given access to uh, you know armiras or whatever okay you know is how do we provide this there is a concept of process okay we will if you do, if not done os course then you should know what is difference between program and process okay anyone can can you tell me what is the difference between program and process you write a program right C program or Java or whatever. Is it same as process? Yeah, no. Anybody? Are you there? Or when program run in memory, it become process. Very good, excellent, just excellent. Okay, program is in hard disk, or it can be on paper. Okay, and there is a. You have to do some work to make it run. You have to bring it to the main memory. You have to create sections. You have to create place where you can have uh, variables, where you can have constants, where you know uh, you can create. If your program is recursive, you can create many more places there, right? You can will have a stack, or you will have heap. When you create is uh, when you create such a space in main memory where the program can run, then it's called process, right? Now there are process, multiple process. You know, even now if you see a number of process in your system, there may be hundreds. Now each process is using some area of memory so can one process read something from other process other process area no that's called isolation a process cannot access the memory of other process all right so permissions are given for the, to each process right okay a process can only change a file etc it has permission to do right so so there is a isolation that's created and then um, because it's connected to the previous point we'll say that it has got has to have privileges only to make changes in its own thing right similarly when you design a browser you know if you look at browser it gets data from various sources okay browser today browser does not get static content it get content from hundreds of places right now this content can also have malicious program or malware or virus, right? So now if your trusted TCB you studied earlier, contains browser kernel, rendering engine and user files. Okay, most important here is rendering engine. So this malicious content can impact rendering engine and then cause damage okay so what yeah. we do is yeah what we do is that then we create a very small trusted computing base like something here and separate out rendering engine and rendering engine runs in a sandbox right sandbox is nothing but isolate an environment to run unsafe code all right okay so now let's move to the next point so what we have studied now is the minimum privileges. Okay, and before that we have studied the layer of defenses. We should have multiple layer of defenses and then minimum privileges that we should give. Third one is separation of responsibility. Okay, don't allow one person to do all the task. And it's a very common sense kind of, uh, you know, property, right? So split up the privileges. Say, so for example, when you go to airport, 
right if you just allow 1% to uh, you know check your uh, in right in the beginning uh, receive you to look at your uh, you know identity card and then uh, do the check in for you and the same person is there at the gate for your entry into a uh, aeroplane then that's not a right model because if that person is made corrupted or it is corrupt then a lot of damages can happen right so what is what do we do in uh, airports right there is a you once you get in then sub there is a security guard who will or or security officer will look at your identity card and check it with your face and then uh, you get in and then uh, same process then is repeated at uh, you know check in counter so they will look at all they already have a lot of information about you and they will do the checks and let you in then finally before you board at the gate again your ticket is checked and so on so forth right and at any point in time if they have doubts then they can also ask for additional uh, checking okay all right so if okay so to perform so basically idea is that to perform a some privilege action multiple parties must work together to exercise that privilege so there is a possibility that single party can be malicious like you know security guard who is letting you in is malicious but others it is very unlikely that everyone is malicious in a system right okay movie theater also you do the same thing right there are multiple checks that happen right somebody at the out gate somebody will issue a ticket then there is a person who will check your ticket and let you in and so on so forth if, when somebody launches a missile you know then it's not it's always dual man control it's not a single man control okay so you can read about it is some um, you know before missile firing is not one person who can just pull the lever it has got to be in a sequence where two people or two maybe three people are involved to release a nuclear missile okay all right the next point is to ensure complete mediation what does it mean okay it's basically uh, suppose you have entry gate okay and then everyone has got to go through that gate okay or if they make me multiple gates but everyone has got to go through multiple gates okay everyone will be checked and looked upon before allowed to get in like if you have firewall whatever for your organization right whatever input is coming from whatever source is coming it has got to go through firewall nobody should be allowed to go directly inside okay that's called complete mediation okay so it, it means that ensure that every access point is monitored and protected all right uh, this is also called reference monitor in os or system or computer system we call it reference monitor a single point through which all access must occur like network firewall airport security and so on so forth right and it should have these properties like correctness completeness and security so that is actually a part of tcv okay this reference monitor cannot be afford to be malicious it has to be correct it has to be complete it has to be secure like if the sentry or you know security guard who is guarding or two security guards who are guarding your north campus or south campus if they are malicious then they will allowed or criminals to come into your campus right so your organization or your director has to make sure that uh, these guys are good they know their job and they provide security they cannot they are they are not corrupt okay all right so in the system we call it there is a user process okay and then user will ask for access request and there is a reference monitor okay for example uh, somebody may want to come to your campus 
or for example examination hall or a library and the person is not from that university maybe from village okay then the person there may ask for id card okay okay and now the policy or institute policy will say that anybody who is associated with institute will be allowed to use library or a lab okay now policy so it's driven by policy and everyone has got to go through reference this reference monitor before using resources all right is this providing look at this diagram so there is a gate here right that will control the flow of vehicles like your toll toll gate etc right we have does it provide security it does it provide complete mediation yes or no no sir yeah because you know you can see that vehicles can go this way it does not provide any so you know when you are providing complete mediation make sure that this is in effect no car is allowed to go this way all right okay good okay let me just move it back off all right now don't that's very important point don't rely on security through obscurity wow okay suppose you are asked to design a crypto system you know i mean crypto system is something that you give an input say a b c d or whatever and that at that's based on some logic comes out with something some different set of like a b c d become star w b x or whatever okay now the question that i'm asking you is that this algorithm crypto algo should be known to everyone or not should you publish this suppose you design a crypto system would you publish this you should not publish it not right okay now this is a wrong answer you should publish this this is called obscurity because this design or algo that you are writing eventually will leak somehow okay this may work for very short period of time but eventually it will leak so security through obscurity says that your crypto system should be known to everyone crypto crypto algo okay and this we we have two terms this uh, for this is called shannon's maxim or is called kirchhoff's principle now let's look at this shannon's maxim says that attacker knows the system they are attacking all right it means that you publish the design of crypto system they they know how crypto works okay so security through obscurity refers to a system that rely on the secrecy of the design algorithm or source code to be secure all right we want to keep the source code or design secret and think that this will work there's a fallacy okay because it is very difficult to keep the design of any system secret from sufficiently motivated attacker you have for example you wrote a secret program then at least hundreds of people will know in your organization okay and then uh, attacker may do something to get that and once attacker gets that then it's all simple right then can attack anywhere or steal all the information which is encrypted so people have tried this method that many system that have relied on secrecy of their code or design failed miserably now the question i am asking you is that i mean you have linux for example or you have many open systems right where source code is not available are they less secure than closed systems like you know like for example you have open source router versus closed system like cisco router 
or you have Linux versus Windows. Do you think Linux is less secure than Windows? No. Right, but Linux, everything, including their encryption, whatever is known to everyone, they know the method. Everyone knows the method, right? Okay. So Kirchhoff principle says that cryptographic system should remain secret even when the attacker knows all internal details of system. Now, how you're providing then security is only with the secret key. So you have a crypto system and then a user is given a key. The user will use this key along with the input. Then that will be used for encryption. Okay. Now something that should be secret is the key. If the key is known to criminals, then they can exploit, you know, they can decrypt. Okay. Now but it's very easy then to change key if something gets leaked. But this crypto algorithm is known to everyone. Is you is doing this encryption, but the secret is coming with the key that you are using. It's like the lock. You know, I mean, you are you are you are asked to design a lock, and you design you make it open source. Everyone knows the design of a lock. Okay, how lock works, what are the parts and so on and so forth, your physical lock. But what is important is the key. If the key is wrong, then lock will not open. Okay, think about this important principle and there will be a lot of questions on this principle, at least one question in your exam. Okay, next point, next important property is called fail safe design. If there is a, you know, for example, you are going in a lift, right? You are going from ground floor to 10th floor and power fails in between. Where does the lift go? It comes down to ground floor or basement. Okay, that's called fail safe design. Okay. So these are the default settings. That is fail safe, right? For example, whenever power goes off, and and you know you are working in in a very secret lab, okay, and power goes off. There are two ways of handling this, right? The door should remain open or it get closed. You have to think about it, right? I mean, whether whether a door should in default should be open or closed it should be closed, right? So no unauthorized person will get into it. Similarly, you know, think of an organization where, you know, there's a fire. Okay, if there's a fire alarm and then should get gates be open or closed, it should open, right? So now it's very tricky to think what is fail safe states, okay? Just think about it and please go through this uh, example. Okay, the last point that we will discuss is called design for security from start. When you're building a house and you build the house, then you think that what, how do I secure it? Then your security will be very bad, okay? Now, right from beginning when you're designing a house in your requirement state itself, I mean, when you, when you design a house, you think of number of rooms and, you know, ground floor, first floor, and so on, so dining room, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What should be arrangement and so on, right? At that point in time, you are designing with the designer or architect. You say the security is important, and we should secure it. And then think what is to be secured and so on, and then have features for it. Because once you build a house, then you think that you know my wall is not good, and number of doors are more, and then and you think of lot of other things, boundary and so on, then what you'll get is a bad quality security, right? Okay. So it should be when you are working in organization and then you start thinking when you are asked to design something, develop something, think that how do we integrate or how do you create 
security features right from the beginning. Okay, otherwise what you get is this kind of security. Okay, all right. So what we have covered today are few principles and overall the principle that we have studied so far is you should know what your threat model is. Okay, because if you don't know your threat model, what kind of threat is there to your system? Like for example, your IIT, for example, your in IIT campus, then your director or somebody or your security officer must think what kind of threats can be there to students, okay? And then they will have to think of whether you need a security guard for each hostel or you have multiple security guards and should it be 24 by seven and then uh, should it be, uh, you know, like in many organizations, the hostels are very close to staff quarters, okay? Uh, because, you know, staff can also have some eye or uh, warden's house is close to the uh, hostel room and so on and so forth, right? So these threats are to be thought of and then security is to be provided for that. And it's because, you know, have more security guards, you can have 10 security guards per hostel, but it will cost money. So that there's the third point, the security is economics, okay? Human factor, humans don't like security in general because it security also provides inconvenience, okay? So system becomes unusable, right? You have multiple levels of uh, login, in, within login you have user ID, fingerprint and so on and so forth, then you may try to avoid that, okay? If something is happening in organization, somebody has sneaked into your organization or your house, you should know about it before. So you can do something, although you can't prevent it, okay? Defense in depth is that you should have multiple ways of defending your system. And if one fails, another layer will should work. Least privileges by default, give the minimum privileges to anybody. Like your students, your all students should not have access to everything, all labs in all departments. That's, that's not a good design, okay? Separation of responsibility is very, example is in an airport, you have multiple people doing multiple tasks. So the very unlikely that all can be corrupt, right? Or uh, we can, all, all parts will have malware. Okay, complete mediation is that when you're designing system, like every, all people are getting into a house, say campus should pass through a security go, gate, right? So all access must be monitored and protected. Next point is don't rely on security through obscurity. We have taken the example where, you know, we have crypto system or log design should be known to everyone. Then we should have fail safe defaults. And when you're designing a system, think of security right from start. It can't be afterthought. All right, okay. Any question? Yeah, no? Okay, all right, thank you. So we'll use this link that I've sent to you today for all the classes. So we'll see whether it works because I'm not very happy with WebEx uh, because uh, you know, it doesn't allow one single link or I don't know, maybe. Excuse me, sir. Link. So, yeah. Uh, sir, I had a doubt. Uh, will you be allowing uh, second year CSE students to uh,